My topic is superovulation and IUI in unexplained infertility. So, and is it an acceptable theory, therapy? Now, okay, so the aim is to create an awareness regarding unexplained infertility and I'll also talk about the diagnosis, controversies and management. Now, basically when you say infertility, I mean, I'm, I'm sure all of you know about it. Basically, it's one year of uh, trying together and if that doesn't work, then you think in terms of infertility. If they are young, you wait for two years and if they are still in the young, you can even wait for three years. But after three years, if pregnancy has not happened, it's very unlikely to happen and the chance of pregnancy will be only less than 5%, if that is so. Now, the thing is, what do you mean by unexplained infertility? Now, in patients who have unexplained infertility, their ovulation is normal and the, when you do a scan, the uterus is normal, the ovary is normal, the AFC count is normal and uh, ideally you should also evaluate and look for tubal patency. And of course, male factor also has to be checked to make sure there is no uh, abnormality on the male factor. Now, other things also that you need to look at is basically also make sure that there are no physical or endocrine abnormalities and then also in some situations if you think it's unexplained infertility you also check for ovarian reserve and that is something which uh, is something which is fairly new with regarding unexplained infertility because there are some other new things also which have come up with regarding to unexplained infertility so this is basically how you make a diagnosis of unexplained infertility now the question question is, does unexplained infertility really exist? When you say unexplained infertility, it means that you really don't know why pregnancy is not happening and therefore you call it unexplained infertility. So the question is, is it, there was a debate and basically Gleicher et al. has said that unexplained infertility should no longer be mentioned, it should not be used as a reason for, in, for infertility and basically you should take the effort to find out why it is not happening or, or basically it's important to try to find out why pregnancy is not happening and just don't call it unexplained infertility. So that is one thing that Glacier et al. was pushing on. The second thing was uh, the debate Bhattacharya et al. from the UK and basically what he says is that it is not, does not need to be removed and that is basically because an accurate diagnosis is difficult and therefore you can call it unexplained infertility and even if you do have some sort of a diagnosis you're not going to change the way of treatment the management will still be the same so therefore you can continue to call it unexplained infertility so basically the question is uh, is a diagnosis unvalid uh, is it really valid and basically one thing that you need to remember is that sometimes in unexplained infertility you really it's difficult to find out what the reason is now one thing is it could be due to some subtle factors and those subtle factors are something maybe with follicular development or ovulation or luteal phase problems or sometimes if the semen count may be along with the WHO criteria but it may be on the lower side. So also there could be some cervical factors. So all those sort of small, small things which is very difficult to identify could be one of the reasons for unexplained infertility. Then of course you look at endocrine problems, genetic problems, immunological disorders, then you will check if there is a problem with ovarian reserve, especially in older patients. If they are 35 plus, then taking a diagnosis of unexplained infertility may, may or may not be the problem. Then of course they also say DNA problems with male factor and nowadays, uh, see generally DNA evaluation is not a standard procedure done on a regular basis, it's only done for certain particular in, in situations. But some people do say now if it's unexplained infertility and pregnancies are not happening, this is something which also needs to be looked at. But not confirmed and it is not, uh, evidence base is still not uh, uh, confirmed with that. Now the thing is, you look at it from a different way. If you're going to look at all this sort of thing, then you're going to be much more expensive. You're going to give, do so many more in investigations. But finally the treatment options are still the same. It is not going to change very much. And that is why it say, the people say that it is really not necessary to go ahead and say unexplained infertility is not a really good thing and you should sort of throw it out and then only uh, try to find out what the reason is and then treat accordingly. But then finally the treatment is almost the same. Now if you look at the NICE guidelines, they say unexplained infertility do not offer ovulation induction, do not uh, tell them to have a fertile period for two years 
if they haven't conceived with a fertile period offer IVF and what they have said is do not offer IUI with or without ovarian stimulation in patients with unexplained infertility. So this is according to the NICE guidelines but if you look at what the UK people have said this has been this guideline has been rejected by professionals because they find that IUI is of benefit in many situations in unexplained infertility and therefore that is something which is really not accepted. So this is some of the controversies with regarding to unexplained infertility. Now how will you handle unexplained infertility? One is expectant management. Don't do anything provided patients are young and provided they haven't been trying for more than three years naturally. So this is important thing so you can reassure counsel and tell them. Now the question is is there adequate evidence for this? Now there's one uh, uh, article which came up in H Human Reproduction in 2015 and this was done in the Dutch group, 25 infertility clinics. They looked at all the people with, uh, with almost 550, 44 people with unexplained infertility and said, let us give them uh, expectant management. Some of them, uh, some of them were 36% of the couples were actually subsequently treated and then they found that both the groups, the pregnancy rates were the same. So basically saying that in certain situations, unexplained, even, with, even with unexplained infertility, natural fertility can happen and you need to look, you, you can advise that provided the age is alright and the duration is also on the lower side. So this is something which needs to be kept in mind. You don't have to treat everybody immediately and you need to look at the background and you can counsel and reassure them. So that is important. Now, the second thing is, See, a lot of people would say that, okay, we will give you some treatment, we'll give you some tablets, give you clomiphene citrate and that sort of thing. Now, one advantage is that it is a safe tablet and uh, it's inexpensive and it gives you some time to think of what is the next option. And also from the patient's point of view, that it is that, uh, okay, they has given me some treatment, so maybe that's of benefit. But the issue is, is clomiphene citrate of any benefit in a patient who has a regular cycle, who is ovulating and called an unexplained infertility. Now this is a trial which we did in almost 1998, looked at it in both groups and we found almost 70 in each group and we found there was no difference whether you gave clomiphene or you allowed them expectant management. And if you look at the recent Cochrane, uh, Federally, uh, Cochrane review has looked at it and said that clomiphene citrate does not have a benefit in patients with, expect, in, in, with unexplained infertility. So you really don't have to give clomiphene, you don't need to give clomiphene citrate for ovulation induction in a patient who's already having regular cycles and ovulating normally. So that is really not a standard or a proper treatment uh, uh, requ requirement. Now, now the Next option is basically in thinking in terms of intrauterine insemination. Now the advantages of that is basically you're increasing the gamete intensity. Uh, you're taking the motile sperm, taking only the good quality sperm, uh, doing a preparation. And also in this situation you're ov doing ovulation induction and then doing IUI. Now the other thing is also you're bringing the gametes together, right? Because by doing, uh, bypassing the cervix, if the cervix has got a problem, bypassing the cervix, and also insemination into the intrauterine cavity. So this is the advantages of doing intrauterine insemination in this situation. Now IUI can be done for a natural cycle or a stimulated cycle. And stimulated cycles can be either with clomiphene or with ideally with, with clomiphene or with gonotrophins. And sometimes people use a combination. Now the combination is generally used to bring down the cost because gonotrophins are a little more expensive. So that is the reason why uh, combinations are used. But generally it is either tablets or injections is what is generally used. And this is, and also the question is whether, what is the difference in pregnancy outcomes when you use the different methods of doing IUI. Now, if you look at what do you mean by super ovulation? Now, induces development of, they say induces development of generally more than one follicle. Now, how do you do it? You give it either oral or injectable drugs and you increase the number of dominant follicles and also by that doing this you may be also be correcting the sub uh, the uh, subclinical th problems that could be there the disadvantage is that it can be a little expensive but the, also it needs to be remembered that hyperstimulation can happen 
and also when you have hyperstimulation or you have too many eggs, then you have what's called multiple pregnancies. Now the question is, is super ovulation, when you say more than one, the question is how many when you say super ovulation and that is an important thing. Now basically for IUI, you have to have uh, very strict rules regarding saying that when it is more than three follicles of more than 18 mm, then you should think it, not think in doing terms of doing IUI or if there are more than five follicles which are more than 12 mm, right? So, because this is the problem with risk of OHSS and risk of multiple pregnancy. Now, risk of OHSS really doesn't happen in this situation because even with IVF, when you have 10, 15, 10, 15 eggs, you're not going to have OHSS. It's more with, uh, if it is something like more than 20. But even then, occasionally it can happen even with when you're doing IUI. So this is something which needs to be kept in mind. If there are more than three follicles or four follicles and then you think in terms of either cancelling the IUI or if it is a larger number, then you can also think in terms of converting it to IVF. So these are things which need to be thought in mind. Now, there are trials which have looked at what's called as oral superovulation methods and all of them have looked at CC plus uh, IUI versus expectant, no difference. CC with timed intercourse versus expectant, no difference. But they found also that they've also said that gonotrophins with IUI versus expectant was no difference. But uh, if you look at the Cochrane review, it looks at IUI natural cycle versus expectant management, they found no difference. So that is, so the natural cycle IUI may, may not be of very much difference. But when they looked at who stimulated IUI cycles was better than when only with IUI natural cycles. So stimulated cycles definitely had a better response. Similarly, they also found that when simulated cycles, they looked at with IUI versus timed intercourse, again, the IUI had a better, inf better, better uh, success rates. So basically, simulated IUI works better than all the other things like natural cycle or timed intercourse. So that has been proven by the Cochrane review. Now, the other thing is, there's a recent article from Fertility Sterility in 20, 2016, which looked at evidence-based approach for unexplained infertility, systematic review. And here again, it says, Expectant management versus clomiphene citrate, timed intercourse, uh, natural int uh, IUI, there's no difference. But with, when gonotrophins was used, it was more effective. And also when gonotrophins and IUI was used, it was more effective. So that is basically saying that uh, important thing is clinicians need to individualize for the treatment options for patients. As I said, younger patients, lower time expectant management, but older patients, that sort of thing, but not too old, then you think in terms of IUI with ovulation, super ovulation. Now, the issue is, uh, I'll give you our experience. This is another article which we had published, and basically when we looked at it, this is published in 2010. Now, with unexplained infertility, the pregnancy rates with IUI was around 11, 11%, 11 to 12%, and more important, what we found was, when the follicles were three in number, then the pregnancy rate was higher, right? And uh, if it was one, the, the pregnancy rate was on the lower side. Now, even with three follicles, uh, we didn't have any multiple pregnancies. So this is something, but when you have three follicles, that chance of multiple pregnancy is there, but it will be on the lower side. So that is also something which can be thought of, and that is basically what you call as superovulation. Now, also when you look at IVF as compared to IUI in this thing, they say that RCT is evaluated, IVF live birth rates versus expectant management, there's no difference. IVF versus IUI, there's no difference. But basically what they're saying is that IVF has a better option and a better success rates, but not proven. So it doesn't mean that you should go directly for IVF when you have an unexplained infertility. You will think in terms of basic treatments first, simple treatments first, and then if things don't work out, then you go to the higher level. Now, this is another trial which was done in uh, 2014, and here they looked at people with clomiphene and IUI, FSH and, IU, and IUI versus IVF, and what they're saying is that IVF has much better rates. So basically what they're saying is uh, it may be better to go directly for IVF. But that again is a little controversial, and uh, when you look at it in a different way, you can say like you do three cycles of IUI, it doesn't work out, then the cost of IUI will be uh, three into, into uh, uh, so much. So therefore, 
the cost factor will be on the higher side by doing so you can go directly for IVF the cost may be on the lower little on the lower side because you're not doing IUI plus IVF sort of thing and going directly for IVF but when you look at it from a different angle your success rates will be generally be around 15 percent or even up to 20 percent with IUI and that is something which can be given to patients so you need to look at time frame number of cycles and the tension that patients have so practice basically we say look at age you need to do a tubal evaluation you generally don't give cc and ovulation induction plus iui at least three cycles with gonotrophins is the ideal method and that's what we call a super ovulation and if that doesn't work then you think in terms of ivf thank you